Hi everyone, I'm Geeta Mehta, the founder of Asia Initiatives, and I want to welcome each and every one of you who's joining us today. Thank you. I also want to extend a special thank you uh, to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, the eighth UN Secretary General, who's joining us for the fifth time to confer the Ban Ki-moon Awards for Women Empowerment. I know you all know much about him, but I just want to highlight that he was the force behind creation of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are the roadmap to a better future for all of us and our children. Um, I also want to highlight that it was his hard work that brought into existence the Paris Accords. And he has uh, really rallied many, many countries behind that in their implementation. But it is his uh, unwavering support for women's empowerment that inspires us every day. He actually appointed more women to high-level positions at the United Nations than anybody else before him. So thank you and welcome again Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And now uh, to take you through today's events, I want to introduce our MC, Natalie Nasensi, an amazing poet and we are just so proud to have her in our team. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here with you today. Our story began with a single idea, 
a grand, inspiring vision. We thought, how can we change the world? Let's start by empowering women. Through the years, with your help, we've slowly grown that mission. Together, we've given thousands of communities the tools for better living. And now, our greatest hope, let's make thousands become millions. Together, we continue to spread the message, empowerment through positivity, creativity, inclusivity, sustainability, and accessibility. Let us share in the ability to be agents of change. You can join us in this journey by donating now by clicking on the link I have just placed in the chat below. Since Asia Initiatives is a 501c3 registered charity, all of your contributions are tax deductible and will go directly to support our projects, especially for long-term support needed by families impacted by COVID. We appreciate your generosity. Now, let's watch a short video of our work. Asia Initiatives is pleased to present our work in the last five years. We are empowering communities through our award-winning community currency of social good, socks, by directly working with the community themselves to find solutions to their problems. Socks are earned by doing an act of social good for the community and redeemed for education, healthcare, and skill empowerment. The goal is to help communities become resilient and self-reliant. Today, we present to you how Socks has helped empower women and transform communities. Cascades of Learning is our flagship education initiative through which participants help younger children stay and succeed in school to earn Socks, which they redeem for different learning opportunities for themselves. Thousands of self-help groups have been established for rural women's livelihood programs that provide low-interest loans for livestock rearing, micro-poultry farms, and other entrepreneurial ventures to almost 2,500 women in Africa and India. SOX has motivated 4,000 women from impoverished communities in India and Kenya to adopt organic nutrition gardens. Communities also earned socks by providing their own labor for desilting and repairing rainwater harvesting structures. These efforts provided water security and prosperity, showing the versatility of socks. Through our socks incentivized health initiatives, over 5,000 families gained access to clean and safe drinking water. 2,000 women and girls have attended health workshops and have access to reusable reproductive products. Our participants in Kenya and India have earned their socks by greening their neighborhoods. We have planted over 50,000 native trees in community spaces. In our socks cascade of upskilling, we trained over 500 women farmers to adopt organic system of rice intensification. They will earn socks for training other women farmers, who will then train others. Over 4,000 women have adopted organic farming thereby completely discarding the use of harmful chemicals in their farmlands. We have encouraged our women farmers to use natural pest control through homemade bird perches and sticky traps for flying insects. Over 1,200 women petitioned the government for better services. Women also came together to create an all-woman water council, Pani Panchaya, in drought-prone regions. Please join us today and help us make this year one of recovery and hope for all communities with lasting, sustainable change towards their own bright future. I hope you enjoyed this video. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the highlight of our evening, a conversation with the 8th UN Secretary, General Ban Ki-moon, and the recipients of the 5th Anniversary Ban Ki-moon Award. Let me now introduce you to our wonderful gala co-chairs, Ramakrishna and Radhika Sagal, who will introduce our honorees. A. Ramakrishna, the founder and chief investment officer at Arga Investment Management, 
has been a long-term supporter of Asia initiatives. As the Chief Administrative Officer, Radhika Sagal has helped create, build, and manage RSG Media Systems. It is my special privilege to introduce Dr. Paul Pullman, a person I've admired for a long time. Paul Pullman is co-founder and co-chair of Imagine and a leading proponent that business should be a force for good. The Financial Times described Paul as a standout CEO of the past decade. As CEO of Unilever between 2009 and 2019, it demonstrated that a long-term and multi-stakeholder model goes hand in hand with excellent financial performance. He was a member of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's high-level panel, which developed the Sustainable Development Goals. I am very much looking forward to reading his book, Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. It is due out in October 2021. As a business person myself, I'm particularly delighted that Paul is receiving the Monkey Moon Award for Women's Empowerment today. Thank you. I am passionate about the cause of education, and so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lee Bei Yong, who is today's recipient of the prestigious Ban Ki Moon Award for Women's Empowerment. She has impacted the lives of innumerable women and girls as the president of Eva Women's University, which is amongst the most prestigious and oldest in Korea. She is the recipient of the Blue Stripes Order of Service Merit and has also served as an advisor to the president of Korea and to numerous organizations conducting research on women's issues. She has worked tirelessly to highlight women throughout the Korean history. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for being with us today and congratulations. Power, wisdom, drive, knowledge, determination, and strength. Leading with grace and integrity, impacting the world at length. Speaking out loud and clear with a purpose. Women, culture, history, and truth. Supporting the forces of good and equality, influence and inspire us all. This is what characterizes our stars this evening. Now, let us watch them in dialogue with our president, Dr. Gita Mehta. Welcome everyone. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. Our deepest gratitude to you, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, for your wonderful support to us as we celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Ban Ki-moon Awards for Women Empowerment. You inspire us every day. Can you please say a few words on this special anniversary to the award recipients this year? Please. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chita Mehta. It's my great pleasure uh, to be with you on the fifth anniversary of this award. I would first like to say that I admire the work of that Asia Initiative does toward the 17 Sustainable Development Goals your community currency SOCCs or social capital credits is a powerful tool to help in entire communities come out of poverty and for empowering women with dignity. This was one of my key focus areas during my tenure at the United Nations. I'm especially pleased that this year the award will go to Dr. Paul Polman, my good friend, and Dr. Lee Bae Young. I want to tell you my own experience working with um, a Chairman Paul Polman since he was appointed as uh, one of the high-level panel of eminent persons that developed the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations. He has continued to be an active UN SDG advocate in his work with the global organizations to push the 2030 development agenda. I'm especially impressed with a new nonprofit organization he has co-founded, Imagine. I see the backdrop, backdrop of Imagine uh, you, <clears throat> to harness the power of the private sector to reduce extreme inequality in the world, and to stem the climate crisis. 
We need many thought leaders like him. I'm also looking forward to reading his book, Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. That is due out, I understand, in October. Congratulations to, to you, Paul, for all these many achievements. I have also known Dr. Lee Bae-yong, president of Yihua Women's University, the oldest university in Korea with 120 years of history. Dr. Lee Bae-yong has been practicing the educational philosophy of sharing, service, love, and education. Dr. Lee has been creating opportunities for talented students of Yihua University to benefit from global networks and international exchange programs. It is my great pleasure to present this award to two very dedicated change makers and thank you for both of your great work. Thank you. Thank you we are indeed so, so honored uh, that you are presenting the award to these two wonderful uh, people who've contributed so much to the world. Um, Paul, um, while our audience knows you best for your leadership at Unilever, we also know that you continue to be a passionate advocate for responsible business stewardship. And I think that is also the subject of your new book, uh, which is uh, Net Positive. So I want to uh, I want you to say a little bit about your ideas and about the book that you have written, uh, which will be released in October, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Geta. First of all, let me just say also that it's a great honor to receive this award, and especially from uh, Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, who is uh, not only a very inspirational leader but also a good and dear friend. And it certainly was a privilege to work together with him on developing the sustainable development goals. That was a wonderful learning period for myself as well that has uh, definitely shaped my life. Uh, I, I will say that you won't find a more passionate advocate or committed advocate, uh, activist, if you want to, who strives impatiently to deliver the 2030 development agenda and the Secretary General's new book will be a welcome addition to that. I also like to congratulate once more Dr. Lee for uh, spreading the concept actually of sharing, service, love and dedication, which are indeed all things that are badly needed. And then finally, to the uh, Asia Initiative and your uh, tireless effort there, Gita, especially for uh, the Asia region uh, to fight for, for the poor, for women, uh, for the environment are all badly needed. Which brings me straight to the book, uh, Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than uh, they take uh, and it will come out early uh, October so you can pre-order now but it's uh, net positive is about creating for me uh, a movement that describes how successful companies can profit profit not from creating the world's problems but actually from solving the world's problems I believe that for business to be successful long term they need to show that they have a net positive impact or in other words make this a better world for all Frankly, if business cannot show that they have a positive effect on society, then why should we let these businesses be around? So it requires a little bit of a different definition of performance, a more comprehensive process, if you want to, of value creation that goes beyond financial returns alone, but also includes people and profit very much at the heart of the sustainable development goals. I would call it moving from CSR or corporate social responsibility, which deals with being less bad to responsible social corporations, which is embedding sustainability in the middle of the corporate uh, strategy if you need to. We describe in the book the net positive companies as those companies that take ownership of all their impacts and consequences in the world, intended or not, that operate for the long-term benefit of both business and society that create a positive return for all stakeholders, not just the shareholder, that drive shareholder value as a result of what they do, 
not as a goal, which is still too much the case for too many companies. And then most importantly, those are companies that actually partner for the broader systems changes that are needed. They're driven by a strong purpose. Uh, often there is a misconception that companies must be either purpose driven or profit driven and that you cannot do both. That is no longer the case. In fact, increasingly it is shown that purpose actually fuels profit and that purpose driven companies and brands outperform uh, the, the, the benchmark if you want to. Just Capital here in the US compared about a thousand companies in the Russell and they found that companies that lead with this multi-stakeholder longer term business model with purpose at the core were in the last four years alone outperforming their competitive set by over 30 percent. So this book helps you not only on your personal transformation because personal leadership is very important but also the system changes that you need to lead as a company to create this world that works for all and to make the sustainable development goals actually come alive. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Uh, we do need um, the major shifts you are talking about. And I also really like that you are emphasizing the urgency of this matter, that this has to be a decade of action. So thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the work you are doing. Uh, Dr. Lee, uh, I would like to now ask you that you have worked all your life to further women's education in South Korea. Uh, we also know that the current pandemic, COVID, has affected education across the globe in ways that are good in some uh, respects and not so good in others. Do you think that the boom in online learning at nearly all universities uh, is here to stay? And will that have a positive impact on women around the world or not? I would like to begin by expressing how honored and grateful I am for the Ban Ki-moon Award for Women's Empowerment as we celebrate its fifth anniversary. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Gita Mehta for all the arrangement, and I'd like to pay tribute to the great achievements of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and express my deepest appreciation for all he has done over the years. And my congratulations also go to the co-recipient, Dr. Paulman. Of course, the online classes are convenient in that they transcend the spatial and temporal boundaries and expand the classrooms further to disseminate information over greater distances and allow communication on a larger scale. However, life cannot be only about convenience. There has to be benefits to be enjoyed and a sense of order in place so that we can rest assured and look for traces of hope. In other words, we need balance. The status quo has continued for nearly two years now, and many teachers and students complain of poor eyesight. Making real eye contact in classrooms, feeling a friendly pat on the shoulder and each other's warm hearts, that can be encouraging in more ways than one. We can utilize online education and collaboration as one of the tools, but I don't believe that the virtual mode should dictate the whole of our education. Harmony must exist between human and nature, between ideals and the reality, and among past, present, and future. Equipped with such wisdom of harmony, we humans must pave the road to the future. The current pandemic is warning us that environmental destruction and animal abuse are unsustainable behaviors, and we must find the good in our hearts again. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That was uh, wonderful advice. I particularly appreciate it because I'm a teacher myself at Columbia University, and I very much agree with everything you said. So Secretary General, I also want to congratulate you on your new book, Resolve, Uniting Nations in a Divided World. We are so excited about it. And thank you so much for including Asia initiatives uh, as, a, in, uh, as a small reference in it. Thank you so much. Uh, can thank you sir. talk a little bit about your book? Well, uh, thank you very much for <clears throat> recognizing my book, my memoir, Resolved, Uniting the Nations, Uniting the Nations in a Divided World. This is what uh, I myself uh, thought about how we have to work uh, 
uh, to really make United Nations really united one. Mm -hmm. So there are so many uh, crises, so many conflicts, so many poverty, human rights violations, etc. So we cannot say that we are living in a peaceful time. Even during 21st century, while science and technology is at this height, so everything should make us much better than before. Uh, but that's what I have been really trying to resolve during my tenure time as Secretary General. This is a very limited story. I could not tell all what had happened during my tenure's time in just 360 pages, a small book, very uh, limited uh, space. But I hope that uh, the readers and people of the world will be able to get, uh, if any, some inspiration from my experience. And I just wanted to uh, spread the ideas and spark the actions. So let the leaders and leaders of political, economic, and business, and societal community to have some global citizenship. It's a very difficult to find global leaders at this time. At best, they are national leaders. It's uh, very disappointing that uh, we don't have many leaders who are really equipped with a global citizenship. Uh, that's what I really wanted to um, uh, share with the readers of the world. Now, as you may know, uh, my life story uh, is now uh, through uh, during the last 77 years, starting from uh, uh, colonial era, uh, then independence, uh, then war. Peace and security has been a very serious one. And then uh, dictatorship in Korea, then fighting for democracy. And then finally, uh, we have achieved some economic development and full democracy. So this is something which other people can learn from what the Korea has been doing, but I'm now talking about the world as a former Secretary General of the United Nations. So I, it's my humble idea that uh, uh, my book can really uh, spread the ideas of uh, global citizenship and do some uh, inspiration, give some inspirations to uh, world's people, particularly political leaders. Thank you very much for your asking this question. Thank you so much. We are very excited to read your book uh, and uh, learn from you always. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to come back to you, um, Dr. Lee. Uh, can you uh, give the viewers, there are a lot of young people watching today. Can you give them just one line of advice uh, as they go forward in their education and careers? 그리고 가장 자신이 즐거워할 수 있는 일을 uh, what I would like to tell the youth of the times uh, today is although things may be tough, do not give up and hold on to your dreams. Choose what you enjoy doing most, believe in yourself and work hard at it and someday your dream will come true. Think positively, you can do it and never lose hope. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul, what are your advice? What is your advice for the many business leaders who are listening to us today? Well, the advice would also be for young people, but for business people, I would say we've never been so forewarned about what's going to happen in the world, but also forearmed with tools to do something about it. And it's well within our means, as the Secretary General said, to solve uh, today's challenges. I also believe actually that it is the biggest economic opportunity that we have ahead of us. We are at the point, as COVID has shown, that the cost of inaction now is significantly higher than the cost of action. When we just looked at four areas in the Sustainable Development Goals, we found an opportunity to unlock $12 trillion in the next 10 years alone and actually create 380 million jobs at a time that we need them. So I realize that change of this magnitude is not an easy thing to do, but um, the world we want to achieve 
is only possible, it's only possible for the business leaders if we choose action over indifference, if we choose courage over comfort, and if we choose solidarity over division. Some of the elements that the Secretary General already has pointed out. Uh, the ones that will seize this opportunity will prosper, but the ones that don't, I believe, will be relegated to the graveyard of dinosaurs. Yes, wow, that is so powerful and so true. Thank you. Uh, Secretary General, uh, would you like to give your final advice as we close this important conversation? My best advice to uh, our youth leaders is that first of all, have a global vision, global vision with passion and compassion. So we have to listen very carefully to the voices of young people. And we have a moral and political responsibility to make sure that we do much more addressing this climate uh, crisis and make sure that sustainable development goals are implemented by 2030 and make sure that uh, we have uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. I believe that for political leaders, this is their political responsibility for us now as a private citizen, moral responsibility, which we have to do it. This is my message to young people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, this is the need for the hour. And I think all of you have reminded us today that we, each one of us has an individual responsibility, also a moral responsibility to work towards a better future for our children, our grandchildren and everyone. Uh, I also just want to close by saying how grateful we are to each one of you for your tremendous contributions to society and for leading the way to a better world. Uh, so using the keywords today, can I say, let us imagine a future with resolve and net positivity. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I would like to remind our viewers that proceeds from this gala will go towards the COVID relief work that we have been doing for our people in projects in India and Kenya, and our commitment to standing by our people as they build back their lives after loss of jobs, savings, and lives. To our brothers and sisters, as sad as it seems in times like these, when we have no control over disease, we have each other, and that is hopeful. Though COVID has brought us to our knees in a battle of sickness and sorrow, we can overcome anything with hope's helpful hands, holding on to a better tomorrow, together with you, now. Let us watch our COVID relief work. The COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted poor and impoverished communities in India and Africa. Asia Initiatives has been providing critical support to the people in our projects who are suffering due to the severe impact of the COVID crisis in India. Many of them have lost loved ones, their jobs, and their life savings. The new wave of COVID reached rural areas where access to proper healthcare resources were sparse. Asia initiatives jumped in to help in three important ways. Education centers were converted to COVID care centers for patients who have clinical symptoms but couldn't access medical support due to lack of beds or distance to the hospitals. We have also committed to support travel of 500 rural villagers and migrant workers to vaccination centers. In the light of new COVID restrictions, means to health and food resources has become very limited. Asia Initiatives has been providing nutrition kits for pregnant women, food packets for migrants returning from cities, and families who do not have the documentation to avail from the government PDS system. Asia Initiatives is also committed to post-COVID support since the loss of lives and livelihoods will take many years to recover from. We will stand by our communities and make them strong, self-reliant, empowered, resilient communities. And we invite you to join us. As part of our COVID resilience program, we are distributing seed kits for kitchen gardens so that women and their families 
can get the much needed nutritional security in such uncertain times. We are also proud of the many young students led by two junior board members of the Asia Initiatives Tokyo chapter, who came together to create a Tokyo for India fundraiser campaign. Please join us to help communities recover from the disproportionate, severe impact of the COVID pandemic by supporting our COVID relief work and post-COVID resilience projects. Together, let's expand, reach families all over the globe, provide a future of opportunities, give them hope, and help them grow. Let's show them anything is possible, no matter what we face. With determination coming from less leads to more, it holds the power to create great change. Every dollar raised today will go to our projects to support COVID relief and build resilience in our communities. Thank you so much for all of your support. And now, we want to hear from you. I would love to invite Dr. Gita Mehta, Dr. Paul Pullman, and Ricky Cage on the screen to answer your questions. Please place your questions in the chat below, and I will bring you up as time permits. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, I want to uh, thank Dr. Pullman and Ricky Cage for joining us for this session. Ricky is joining us early in the morning at 2 a.m. his time in India. Thank you for that. Uh, please you, do put your, <laughs> thank you. Please put your questions in the Q&A button, actually not the chat button. Uh, but I'm already seeing some very good questions. So, um, you know, I was just talking to my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Gita Johar at Columbia, and she said there's quite a buzz in the business school because Dr. Polman is with us. So I'm going to I'm going to ask uh, Gita Johar to please come on the screen and ask her question, uh, and then we have many other good questions coming. So can we bring Gita Johar please on the screen? Thank you very much, Gita, for giving me the first question. Um, and Dr. Pullman, it's really great to hear from you. And it is very true what Gita said, the business school faculty and students were very excited to hear that you will be joining us today. So let me be quick about my question. And it's really, uh, I'm sure all laid out in your book, but can you tell us what specific actions companies could take to move from being corporate from corporate social responsibility to being, as you said, socially responsible corporations? And what role do consumers have to play in moving business, businesses and corporations in that direction? Thank you. No, thanks for the opportunity. And again, uh, very uh, happy to be with you. And, and Gita, congratulations for putting this on. And my uh, respect for Ricky as well. Uh, Himalaya was uh, a very appropriate song to share with us because we're under threat there and there's no better way to uh, point it out than what you do for Save the Children and being an ambassador for the SDGs, my full uh, um, respect and certainly getting up so early to be with us. <laughs> Again, shows you being a very busy man that, uh, that this is uh, close to your heart. So I really get strength from that and, and the world needs it. So very simply, um, what we saw last year, World Overshoot Day was July 29th which is actually the day that we use up more resources than the world can replenish. Every day after that, if you want to keep it very simple, we're actually stealing from future generations. I don't want to be part of that. I don't think many people that are listening in today want to be part of that. So it is not good enough anymore in the situation that we find ourselves to think uh, circular economy or to think CSR, which often deals with less bad. We really have to start thinking, restoring, repairing, regenerative. And this is what the book is all about. It's net positive. If companies are actually part of a problem, even being less part of a problem, you're still part of a problem. Why should we leave these companies around? Companies need to start thinking, and it is a difficult journey, but they need to start thinking of becoming positive. And what do net positive companies really look like? These are companies that take responsibility of the total impact in society. 
Uh, I saw another question on the media. You cannot be on the one side Facebook and say, oh, we connect people, aren't we a great company? But then don't take responsibility for the hate speech that's on there or the political division that takes place or the false news, if you want to. You have to take responsibility of your total footprint or handprint, as I call it. Just like Unilever being in food as part of it or Hindustan Lever, as, as Ricky knows it very well in Gita, um, you know, we, if we are if we have deforestation in our value chain, we are responsible to fix the issue of re deforestation. If there is food waste, if there are poor farmers, you know, we need to be part of the solution. Um, so the second thing that net positive companies do is really they run it for the multiple stakeholders. They're not myopically focused on the shareholder. They are good companies like Wipro and in, in India would be or or uh, obviously um, Infosys or or many of the other companies, I don't want to single out Tata. These are companies that, that take care of all of their stakeholders. And only by taking care of all your stakeholders will eventually the shareholders benefit. And the last thing that these companies do, they're actually part of the broader transformation. Walmart made an initiative to prepare, uh, to, to restore forests, to protect oceans, to become regenerative. Uh, Microsoft made a commitment to compensate for all the carbon emission since they started in 1975. That is regenerative. So companies that want to be successful long term need to have those characteristics. What can young people do? Well, a few things, obviously. First of all, 50% of the world population is below 30 years old. And I always remind them they're going to be 100% tomorrow. And I know Ricky has much more to say about them, but they are innovative, they are creative, they are much better in partnership, they think multi-generational, they understand technology. They see this not as all the problems we leave them, but they see this as enormous opportunities they want to embrace. So get the young people at the table or give them the table is very important. Young people need to look in their own behaviors, what they can do, there are many ways that you can save energy or eat healthier or change your transport habits. Some of the key drivers of climate change, for example, then they need to advocate. The voices of young people are a tremendous voice for change within companies. Every company has a greater thorn burn, if you want to, but also with politicians. Most of the changes that we now see in the world are coming from young people speaking up. And then last but not least, participate in the political process. Be sure that we elect the right people and, and not the wrong people. And often the younger people have been disengaging themselves globally, and that's unfortunate. And my final point, and then I'll, I'll stop is, you know, use your spending power. This is an enormously uh, powerful group of people if combined. Um, they're also inheriting some wealth in some parts of the world. Uh, we see them being so much more purpose driven. So be sure that you spend your money on the right things. And it is now easy to find out with the internet, AI and other things, who are the ones that are really committed and who are the ones that are greenwashing. Sorry for taking the time, but this is an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Actually, you talk about young people uh, and I'm gonna bring up now a young person, David, who actually volunteers with us to ask his question. Thank you, Gita. Uh, so, so, David, celebrate can... Ricky's birthday. That was August fifth. I saw only ten days ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, happy birthday, Ricky! Happy birthday. birthday! Yeah, David, can David be brought on screen, please? Thank you, Gita. So uh, now I also want to tell you, Paul. Uh, Ricky already knows that we have so many young people helping us. You know, so we have like about maybe 30 direct volunteers who are volunteering every week. And then we have many, many more. So young people are actually the strength of Asia initiatives. So I'm really, really proud of the young people. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're so right. They are going to lead us into the future. And there's David. David, you had a question. Why don't you ask Ricky? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I just wanna say it was really great to hear from both of you, Mr. Palm and Mr. Cage. Um, it was amazing what you have to say and the work you do is really incredible and honorable um, and so it's a lot to look up to so as, as a young person so uh, my question was um, for you Ricky um, how can music raise more awareness about the environmental crisis that we are in so thank you so much for that question David so first I wanted to address something that Paul said because uh, when I started off my career in music uh, uh, I mean, I've always been an environmentalist and a musician, two pillars that have pretty much dictated my whole life and all of my life decisions. And 
you know, even though a lot of my music did reflect the environment in the initial stages of my career, I started off my career doing commercials for television and radio. So I did a whole lot of commercials for all the brands that you represented, that is PNG, Nestle, and Unilever. In fact, this whole studio that you see around me has been built on Unilever money. So, <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that. And so anyway, so but then uh, after doing that for about 13 years and after doing more than 3000 commercials during that time, uh, it sort of hit me that big brands have understood the power of, uh, uh, you know, the power of music so much so that they understand that, you know, that music is a very good, uh, uh, is a very powerful language, not just for communicating a message, but for retaining that message deep uh, in the consciousness of a listener. Uh, like, uh, and uh, big brands have understood that, you know, that they can spend a couple of thousand dollars on me to actually create a piece of music and a couple of million dollars to actually air that music on television and radio. So they understood the power of music. And that's why after 13 years of doing that, I decided that I'm going to stop all forms of commercial music. And, you know, I'm going to use the power of music this time. And I'm going to only make music that I, about things that I feel strongly about. And every piece of music is going to be an extension of my beliefs and my personality. And I mainly think about sustainability and the environment that's these are things that keep me awake at night and that's why all of my music is about that but at the same time you know to answer your question david that uh, uh, you know more awareness is always extremely important uh, but i do believe that everybody on this planet at some level is aware of all the problems that we have you know maybe not at a statistical level maybe not in an overarching level but some amount of uh, awareness is there that you know that these are the problems whether it's society problems or whether it's environmental problems uh, but the golden question actually is, how do we convert that awareness into action, you know? So that is basically, in my opinion, how do we convert all this awareness into action? And I believe that all of us are not taking action, not because we're evil people, but it's just because we have not empowered ourselves to believe that the small incremental changes that we make in our own lives are actually powerful enough, uh, you know, to make a long lasting difference. And, uh, and so that's why I believe that when it comes to uh, the environmental problems, it's mainly and this is my personal belief that it's mainly a communication issue because when you look at overarching things and I am a strong champion for the SDGs and I believe that the SDGs should be the new religious books of our planet. Uh, but uh, the thing is that the, when, you, when, a, when a common person looks at you know, zero poverty and zero hunger, they believe that it's somebody else's problem. You know, they do not believe it is their problem. And that's the reason why what I did was that in India, um, you know, I realized that India is a very complicated country and uh, during my numerous trips to rural India and spending a lot of time with the tribal groups and, you know, in the villages and uh, places like that in the remotest of areas, I realized that, you know, that in India, everybody looks at the environment as being a thriving problem and not a survival problem when it should be looked at upon as a survival problem. Climate change is looked at as a, as a thriving problem, whereas the more seemingly immediate problems like poverty, hunger, gender inequality, gender violence, uh, education, water, sanitation is looked upon as a, as a survival problem. So I realized that I need to have a holistic approach towards problem solving. So that's why what I did was that I created children's songs for the first time in my life. I wrote 27 nursery rhymes based on the 17 sustainable development goals. And uh, right now they are in, uh, currently they are in about 10 million textbooks across India, uh, you know, in, in the regular educational curriculum textbooks and science and social studies and English textbooks. So what I've done is that I've taken these seemingly complex problems and ideas and I've simplified them to nursery rhymes so that children can learn this and the conversation on conservation and sustainability can start at a younger age. So these are the various ways that I've been trying to, you know, work on to actually bring, uh, you know, and then of course I do concerts at uh, to, on a larger level to uh, what do you call that to, to heads of state and to corporate leaders and the people who can bring about change at a mass level. What would be a top down approach? And I do large concerts to at festivals to a larger audience. So basically, there are various ways, but yeah, music is a very powerful way to actually bring about uh, change and awareness and and action. Thank you, thank you, Ricky. Thank you, David. You know, we have one more question from another young man. Uh, we're going to bring him up now. Sumitra, can Sumitra Prabhu please? Uh, please come on the screen and ask. Uh, Paul, this is a serious question. Be ready for it. <laughs> Samitra uh, is one of our volunteers. He actually teaches technology to, uh, to the informally incarcerated women in New York. So Samitra, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mehta. So uh, Dr. Pullman, I remember you saying that there have been uh, many changes in business and overall positive changes. And I was hoping that you could expand and uh, maybe give some specific examples of how these changes have helped. Yeah, no, I will do that. Uh, 
Sumitra, first of all, thanks what you are doing for uh, formerly incarcerated people. In the U.S., that's a big population and, um, and still uh, deprived of basic rights after these people have paid for their crimes. For example, the right not to vote, uh, mm -hmm. nearly 100 million people in the U.S. And, and this, I think, is uh, undermining democracy ultimately. So fighting for open hiring uh, like we do in, in companies like Ben and & Jerry's and others and, and fighting for the rights of the underserved uh, is, is a noble thing and that is as much needed in the U.S. Uh, that some people sometimes try to deny as it is needed in other places of the world. Uh, what companies are starting to see increasingly so is, is the shortcomings of our failures. If I just take a, a small example of COVID, a tragic example, but the world has currently lost about the equivalent of $23 trillion uh, as a result of COVID in lost GDP. Um, if you look at basically the US and, and Europe alone, they have spent uh, over $18 trillion in terms of um, saving lives and livelihoods and, and trying to get these economies going again. And the story isn't finished. Here in the US, they just passed again a trillion dollar infrastructure uh, packets and another social support packets. Now, on the one side, it's a tragedy that these rich countries can spend so much money in the trillions and not be willing to help developing markets with climate change or or with providing the vaccines. It's a tragedy. Uh, there can not be any other word. And here business has spoken up because business understands that if these countries cannot function and work together, then trade flows don't work. Lots of countries have put barriers in place. And I think companies, as an example, have spoken up. But companies have also seen themselves that the cost of inaction because of us sleeping at the wheel and not reacting to the destruction of biodiversity, to the high, the increased inequality, to the uh, devastating effects of climate change, we all of a sudden wake up and we incur costs that are significantly higher than what we need to spend now to avoid it. To implement the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 famous goals with 169 targets, uh, I proudly wear the pin here, as you see, they only need an incremental two to three trillion dollars a year. I would now argue, um, uh, uh, Sumitra, that on each of the goals now, we are incurring more costs than it would cost us to implement all of the goals, which is very sad. You know, today we have the sadness of, of uh, Afghanistan and another country where women's rights are again being grossly violated and going back, not forwards. There are only, by the way, six countries in the world where women have equal rights, a sad statistic. But conflict prevention and wars, this now in the world, is taking up about 10% of the global GDP. That's three or four times more, goal number 16 this is, which is called uh, justice and peace. This is three times more than the implementation of all the sustainable development goals. Holding women back cost us $12 trillion in the global economy, four times more than what it would do. So business starts to understand that because they're on the front line. They see the effects of climate change coming into their business models. They see the effects of inequality, their employees speaking up, disconnected from their customers. I'm not saying all businesses, I'm not naive. But for example, on climate change, we now have 25% of the uh, companies and emissions that are making serious plans, also in India, serious plans to reduce, for example, their carbon emissions in the value chain. And doing that within the 2030 timeframe, not making false promises for 2050. I believe that now that we have a moment of difficulty in globalization and, and not all governments taking the responsibilities that they should take, that it is important for business to get together, to speak up and move forward and for, force governments to actually uh, be more um, progressive or forward thinking, or the best word is more courageous. It's one of the reasons I created Imagine to start to make that possible by bringing businesses together to accelerate the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Samitra. Um, Paul, I'm going to actually pick on you for your Imagine, right? I just love that concept so much. So um, we are running out of time, but if you and Ricky can just imagine if everything was possible, what do you dream of? What is your dream? Tell me in just like one minute or less. 
Oh, I do one minute of less. I was born in the Netherlands and I didn't do anything about it. I didn't have a problem of stunting. I had enough nutrition in the first thousand days. I had a piece of bar soap. It wasn't life boy, but I didn't go. I didn't I, I didn't belong to the four million children who still today die before the eights of five of infectious diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea. I had free education from the Dutch government. We had uh, six children at home. I would never have been educated. Otherwise, my father worked in a factory. So I won the lottery ticket of life by being born in the Netherlands. My point is very simple. If you've won the lottery ticket of life and have a certain level of independence and freedom as a result of that, uh, you only belong to 5% of the world population. It is your duty to put yourself to the service of the other 95%. And that means fighting till the last day to ensure that this is a world that works for all. This is a world that works for the planet, that works for everybody in equity and inclusion but it also works for future generations and i think that is why we're here ultimately passion is really about yourself but purpose is actually putting yourself to the service of others and that is the ultimate purpose that i think we need to muster when we are all in a position to do something about it and i know gita that you are doing this and are a great example to all of us thank you that is so amazing Thank you. Uh, Ricky, what do you imagine if everything in the world was possible? So uh, I, I'm a musician and uh, the thing is that for me, I always think in musical terms all the time and when and I record with large orchestras all the time, like symphony orchestras. And whenever I look at a symphony orchestra, I look at the violins, which is like a really soft instrument. And then you look at, uh, you know, the timpanis, which is a very loud instrument and it's a percussion instrument. Then you look at a tuba, which you can get deaf if you're in the same room with it. Then you look at a harp, which is a soft instrument. You look at the piano, which can be soft or hard. All these instruments have got its own personalities. And a violin is not trying to be a piano. A piano is not trying to be a tuba. A tuba is not trying to be a trombone. And then, you know, and it, it sort of like, you know, makes me think that, you know, why, why can't the world be this way, you know? In the sense that where everybody maintains their own personality and nobody's trying to be somebody else. And yet when everybody plays together, everybody plays together as one, you know, in absolute harmony and everybody sounds so beautiful together. So that's how I would like the world to be like a symphony orchestra where, you know, everybody maintains their personality and all of that stuff. And secondly, if, if I have to add a second thing, everybody just starts consuming lesser of whatever they're consuming. That's all. Because I believe that we have an overpopulation problem, but bigger than that is an overconsumption problem. So everybody should just start consuming lesser of whatever they're consuming. Great. Ricky, so why don't you lead us with your music to close this event? Over to you, Ricky. Okay, so now we've come to the end of this amazing uh, Asia Initiatives, Angela, and I'm so honored to be a goodwill ambassador with the Asia Initiatives. As I said, you know, they're taking an absolute holistic approach towards problem solving and so proud to be a part of this amazing, amazing family. So what an experience this has been and you can still donate. Uh, so please donate uh, on the link in the chat window and it's also going to appear on your screen. So I wish I could have been there with you in person and I'm a, uh, since I feed off the energy of my audiences, but Today, I have to speak directly into the lens of my camera, <laughs> my web camera, but such are the times. And it's been a huge honor to be amongst you. So let us end this on a huge high. So if you have a camera in front of your web camera, please turn on the camera. Uh, that is your Zoom camera. Please turn on your camera. And administrators, please put up as many people on the screen as possible, as many boxes, so that we can see everybody's faces and everybody can see each other. So let's go ahead and do that. And all of you have a cell phone, I'm sure. So. Uh, let's uh, turn on the flashlight of your cell phone. Let's do that, everyone. So let's uh, try and get as many people to turn on uh, the flashlights of their cell phones. Wave it. And uh, let's shine your light at your camera and at everybody over here on the call. So here is my song, Shine Your Light. So let's play Shine Your Light. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's wave our light. Let's shine our light. Let this light reach all the way to India. Come on. They have to shine our lights to we India. Come on. We are all in this together. We are all in this together. And nothing can remind us like a simple act of kindness. Hey! And in the blackest of nights, just one flash of light shows when I.